I'm Nancy Lynch, and I'm here at Senior Center Television in Iowa City, and today I'll be interviewing Jean Lloyd-Jones. Jean uh, was a member of the Iowa Legislature for 16 years, and she has some very interesting experiences. Many of us have an interest in politics. We like to talk about politics. We like to watch debates on television but we never get around to doing it. And Jean has had the experience of running for public office and holding office, and she's going to tell us about that today. Jean, can you start out by telling us what offices you held exactly and for how long? I was a member of the House of Representatives from 1979 until 86. And then uh, from 87 to 94, I was a member of the Iowa Senate. Um, I held various uh, uh, positions as assistant majority leader. Uh, when I was in the Senate, I was president pro tem of the Senate. Um, I chaired the Senate Transportation Committee, chaired the House State Government Committee. Um, and then when I was in my last term as senator, I ran for the U.S. Senate in the, in the second, in the middle of my last Senate term. And I ran for the U.S. Senate against Charles Grassley and suffered the same uh, result that everybody else who has ever run against the senator has had. When you went to uh, Des Moines in the first place, uh, back in, what, 1984? No, I, w I went to Des Moines in 1979. Oh, in 1979. What was the, what did the legislature look like at that time? There were um, 15 women out of 150 legislators. There were, um, let's see, there were Fifteen. There were eleven Republican women and four Democratic women. I was one of the. I was the only new Democrat, Democratic woman elected that year. Um, it was an overwhelmingly male atmosphere. Um, and furthermore, the chambers were full of smoke because everybody smoked. The legislators smoked, the secretaries smoked, the press box was full of smoke. It was just, for me, it was just, I, I hated it, you know, <laughs> I just couldn't stand it. Um, so that was one of the first things that I did. I started agitating for, uh, uh, to clear out the smoke and uh, we got, we made a little progress my first year and uh, kept on, and now the entire Capitol complex is smoke-free. That's amazing. I would never have thought of that as yeah. being such an, and, and what is the difference now? If you were to go back and look, what changes have been made besides the atmosphere? There are a lot more women now. There are 34 women. Um, <clears throat> Although I, I would like to point out that when I, when I went there, there were 15 women. When I retired in 94, there were 22 women. Now there are 34 women. And if we keep on at this rate, we will have 50% women by the year 2097. Oh dear. Now, we, I said in the beginning that you were a doer rather than a talker about issues, and I know that you have a real concern for getting more women involved in politics and more women holding public office. And so, what is it that you're doing about that? I know you have a, a well. Plan. I am yes. <laughs> I am co-chair and co-founder of an organization, a bipartisan organization called Fifty Fifty in Twenty Twenty. And our goal is to have 50% of the legislature be female by the year 2020, which is the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. Seemed like a good date. Yes. Um, and to have uh, three women in the United States, in the Iowa delegation in the U.S. Congress, 
and to have a woman governor, which we have never had. And uh, so exactly what else, did, what does your group do to uh, encourage women to? We, uh, we have a campaign school for women who have decided they want to run for the legislature or a higher office. And we hold that every other year in January. It's a very intensive two-day session. Um, we call it the Blueprint for Winning Academy. Academy may be a bit of a, an ambitious word for it. Um, but we start off by telling them there are two rules. You may not discuss issues, and you may not discuss presidential preferences. Remember you mean this in the school? In the school. Okay. Because we have women of both parties there. And uh, we are concentrating on how you organize a campaign. What do you have to do first, second, and third? How do you raise money? How do you handle the media? Uh, and one of the most important things is helping them stand up in front of a TV camera and give their stump speech. Now we do divide them into their parties for that. And we bring in a very well-known uh, speech coach from Washington, D.C. named Chris Yonke. And she works with each one of them individually on mm -hmm. their speaking skills. The candidates say it is the most painful thing they've ever had to do, be televised, watch themselves on TV, and then, you know, go, go through that with Chris. But they said it is also the most helpful thing that Now, do. do many of the women who come for your class, uh, have they held office you know, in the county or city or something like that, or school board? <clears throat> do they have any experience at all? Some of them have. Uh, some of them just come in out of the blue and, um, you know, self-select and say, I'm going to run against, and they'll be running in an impossible district. One of the things that we're trying to encourage is a more realistic assessment of your chances. Um, you know, there's no point in just being a sacrificial lamb. Mm -hmm. If you can find another place to run first, you know, run for the city council, the, run for the school board, run for the board of supervisors, build yourself a resume, and watch for your opportunities. Um, you know, we have a lot of turnover in the legislature. There's always people retiring or uh, House members running for the Senate or whatever, leaving an open seat. What we find is that every time there's an open seat, there are at least two men ready to run for that seat. The women are sitting back saying, oh, oh, there's an open seat. <laughs> you know, we need to be more on the ball and um, more aware of our, of our uh, political address. And why do you think that's true? Why do women always, or not always, but often uh, react that way? They, they may yeah. even look for some male candidate to, to oh, help yeah. out or serve in that way. Uh, how can we change people's mindset? Nancy, if we knew that, we <laughs> would have done it by now. It, it's a really very complicated um, picture, I think, that we have um, in this culture. Uh, not only do women fear running for office, women do not support other women who are running in the same percentages that men do. Men are more apt to support a woman running for office. This has been borne out in a lot of races. Um, you know, I think in our culture, men are encouraged from young and young age to think of themselves as being able to run for anything they want to or do anything they want to do. And, and women have been defined in, in lesser ways. Um, 
So what we find is that when we ask women to run, and we always have to ask women to run because they do not volunteer. Very few women volunteer to run. Um, so they answer, um, oh no, I, uh, I'm not qualified to run. Uh, I have a family, I can't leave my family. Um, I'm afraid to get up in front of people and speak. Uh, we discovered another thing that they weren't saying, but is obviously a barrier, and that is the whole scene at the state capitol is, is daunting to a lot of people. I mean, it's a big, beautiful, impressive place. And by the way, it's a wonderful place to work. It's a beautiful place to work in, and I, when I was there, I would every morning when I would go in the Capitol, I would say, I am so lucky to get to work in this gorgeous building. Um, so uh, our organization um, developed a program called See Yourself Here, and we invite women who think they might someday want to run for state legislature to come and we give them a behind the scenes look and they get to meet the leaders of both parties, um, get to have conversations with women legislators. And it only takes a half a day before they're beginning to say, legislators are just people like you and me. And we say, right, it's a citizen legislature. What qualifications do do these men have? You know, the women say, oh, I'm not qualified. Well, you know, on that basis, neither are the men. <laughs> They're just citizens. They're just ordinary citizens who decided to run and do their um, public service. Do you think there's a difference now? Uh, young women are growing up with very different uh, ideas than you and I had. I mean, when we were young, girls were not encouraged to get out in public and speak and do things like that. And now I think young women are being taught very differently. Have you noticed that there's a change? Indeed we have. And, uh, and two of the women who were elected this last year um, did indeed, are younger, uh, are unmarried, are willing to uh, run for office and and go for it, and uh, that's very encouraging. And that's what has to happen, because when I was there, for example, all of the women were had already raised their families, and you can't have a long career mm -hmm. at that point. So they have to start young and. Uh, and keep it up and, and move up. Um, so as you think back about uh, your experience, are there some women who served as mentors for you or are there some, uh, is there, you know, some, some thing or some group or something that encouraged you or? Yes, of course. Um, the woman that first comes to mind is Manette Doder. She's the one who asked me to run, and when I said, oh, I'm not qualified, she said, <clears throat> why don't you come and work for me for a week? Uh, my secretary is going on vacation, and you can be my, my clerk for a week, and I'll introduce you around and see if you like it. Well, of course, that's all it took. Just being in that environment and meeting those people up close uh, it, you know, you say, I could do as good a job as they're doing out there punching their little red and blue, red and green buttons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another woman who was a great help um, was a woman named Marie Wilson. Marie Wilson was uh, on the city council. She might have even been mayor of, Cedar, of uh, Des Moines. She was hired to go to New York and run the Ms. Foundation. And then she started a group called the White House Project. And it was to 
start young girls thinking about moving up and being the uh, U.S. president someday. Uh, when Marie was in Des Moines, uh, we had a women's caucus in the legislature. Um, Manette Doder was the one who said, we have to have a women's caucus. The leadership did not want us to have a women's caucus. They do not like what they call special interest groups having caucuses. But um, Manette said, <clears throat> we are going to have a women's caucus and we are going to meet every Wednesday at noon. Senators, representatives, Democrats, Republicans, and, um, and we did. There were some issues that we did not discuss at all because we knew that we would never agree. But there were lots of issues that were bipartisan that the women could agree on. A woman from the Senate would say, I have an amendment to a bill that you have in the House, and I would appreciate it if anybody could support it. And we'd say, okay, what is it? And she'd explain it, and pretty soon you'd have most of the women on her, you know. We got a lot done that way. And that's probably why they didn't like it, why I didn't want you to do that. That's right. The leadership doesn't want, the leadership wants to have party loyalty. And uh, on some issues, they would even take us to their, you know, take us to the woodshed, as we used to say, and insist that we vote the party line on something. But in, on other way, in other uh, instances, we were, we could go our own way. And one time I remember, after I was in the Senate, towards the end of the session, a lot of bills come before you and you don't necessarily know what they all are, but you know, you've seen them three or four times before, so you, you just go and, and everybody's busy. So you go up to your desk and you push the button and then you go off and answer the phone or whatever has to be done. And there was some issue uh, that I was voting on that way and I went off and one of the men said, why are all the women voting no on this? And I looked up and I said, I don't know, but it was true. All the women had red lights uh -huh. up there, but it was And it wasn't something, something you had discussed before? No, no. it was just something apparently we all did. I said, I, I will always remember Manette Doder for the legislation that she introduced and, and pushed through about uh, domestic abuse. And I served at a, a, on a jury once, and that legislation made all the difference. Yeah. And in the end, her abuser had to go and, and uh, get some help, which is, you know, exactly what yeah. I thought was necessary. And it really could appreciate right. her, her role in that. Right. She was a leader on that. And uh, and on many other issues, equal pay for equal work. She was one of the, you know, staunchest on that. Um, there are lots of issues, and there have been a lot of studies done on this, that when you have women in uh, legislature or in Congress, they introduce more legislation uh, having to do with family, safety, um, education, health, uh, just a lot of, and even environment now, um, things that if the men had, if it had been all men, it would never have been brought up, let alone passed. Mm -hmm. um, now, be, having said that, I want to make it clear that I do not think that women should take over. <laughs> I think it would be just as bad in different ways mm -hmm. to have the women, uh, if it were 80, 20 women, it would be just as bad as it is now. Um, we need to have the mix because uh, men and women bring different perspectives, different uh, experiences, different um, ways of looking at the world, and you need that mix to make 
things better. Been a lot of studies uh, on what happens in a in a corporation if women are put on the board of directors and into the executive suites. Mm -hmm. um, and there are three things that always happen. The conversation becomes more civil. More points of view are uh, listened to. And the solutions are more pragmatic. And in business, profitability increases. And has anyone looked at government with their same? There are not enough women in government to make the, that kind of study yet. Now, I know that Iowa has not had a, you said this, a, a woman governor or a woman in the House of Representatives, isn't that right? In Correct. In Washington, D.C. And Correct. recently only got a senator. How, how does Iowa stand as among other states? Are we way behind or are we sort of We're like everybody else? Iowa is sort of in the middle now um, with the election of um, Republican Joni Ernst last year to the U.S. Senate. We at least got over that blot on our record of being on one of only two states that have never elected a woman to the U.S. Uh, government or a um, woman governor. Now we're in the class, and there are, uh, there are quite a few other states that have never had a governor, a woman governor. And so. uh, as far as the state legislature and things are concerned, is that about average right. for most we're of the Right, we're about 23% now, and that's, that is probably now just a little bit below average. We used to be right in the middle, but right now. What do you think are the possibilities of even close to 50-50 by 2020? Yeah. I think, I think it's going to be a very hard row to get to 50-50 by 2020. Um, in, the, in the election before this one, in 2012, we reached the benchmark that we had hoped for, and that was 35 women. In 2014, we needed to elect 45 women. We didn't come anywhere close, in fact, we lost, we had a net loss of one. Mm -hmm. So we only have 34 women in, in the legislature now. The reason that we didn't come close is that not enough women ran. When, when women run, they win in the same percentages that men do. But seven times as many men run. And so we had to have a lot more women running um, and they just, we just were not able to recruit them. Now, uh, I think, uh, can you tell, can you, I guess we can put this on, um, you're going to have to cross this out too. What, uh, you know, what would you say to young women who are interesting, interested in running? And is there, where would you suggest that they go for help uh, running for public office? I tell young women that if they run for office, it'll be one of the most exciting, rewarding things they could do. Even if you don't win, uh, a campaign is, um, is a wonderful experience. You learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about other people. You meet wonderful people. Um, and uh, we, in fact, 50-50 in 2020 holds a session after the election. Two sessions, one for the women who won to help them get started in a good way, and one for the women who did not win this time to help them realize what they gained by running and to think about their options for the future, whether to run again or whether some of the skills that they learned can be applied in another profession or another career. Um, serving in the state legislature was one of the most exciting, wonderful things I ever did. Um, I learned a lot about issues I didn't know anything about. Uh, it's, a, it's a learning on the job situation. You can't possibly know everything before you get there. You have to learn 
uh, as you go along. Um, and I can tell you why people keep running again. Because you have a little bit of success with an issue. And you want to come back next term and make sure that nobody gets it repealed. <laughs> mm -hmm. You want to protect what you did and, and improve upon it if possible. Uh, you get hooked by, by the issues that you work on. Um, so, and, even, <coughs> and, and another thing I would say to people is, you don't have to do this for the rest of your life. You can do it for two years, four years, whatever, six years, and then retire and go on to something else. Um, it it will um, it, it and it is an experience that very few people have. I read somewhere that only one percent of the population runs for office. So. A lot more people could run. And you said one, there's seven men for every woman who runs. Right. So, I mean, think that's like three tenths of a percent of women. Correct. <laughs> I, I got my interest in legislation through the League of Women Voters. Um, and the issues that we studied became um, the things that I, that I wanted to work on when I got there. The, the League provided a, a tremendous um, advantage for me. And by the way, a lot of the women who were serving at the time that I went in, um, a lot, there were only 15 of us, but most of them claimed that they had been in the League um, either as members at large or as members of a, of a local League and that that's how they had gotten their start in, um, in politics. When I was state president of the League, um, I got to go and lobby the legislators for our issues and um, sort of had a sense of how, you know, bills got passed and how they got defeated and <laughs> so on. Um, so I, uh, the League was a really uh, important part of my preparation, although I had no idea at the time. I'd never thought of running for office when I was in the League. So you, when, when uh, you said Minette Doder asked you to run, is that yes. when she did, were you totally surprised? I was. Um, it was after I finished um, my two terms as state president, and I was talking with her one day, and I, she said, what are you going to do now? And I said, I have no idea. I, it's like falling off a cliff, you know. I don't know what I'm going to do now. And she said, why don't you run for the legislature? Just out of the blue. And it was such a shock. I said, oh, I couldn't do that. I, I'm not qualified to run for the legislature. She, did, she didn't say, oh, poo, you are too, but she said, come and work for me, you know. Right, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And so when you look back, what would you say are, you know, your accomplishments that you think are the most meaningful to you? Um, I think, uh, oh, I had, I had a lot of issues that I worked on and that, uh, that I found great satisfaction in. Um, probably the first major thing I got passed was the uh, Buckle Up Baby Bill. It mm -hmm. had been introduced for several uh, sessions and never got out of committee. Um, Linda Mustin and a colleague of hers took me by the hand and said, we're going to show you some things about why it's important to have child restraints. And we went to Mercy Hospital and they showed me a video of children who had been uh, injured in, in uh, you know, because they were not restrained in the car. 
And um, after being with them for the whole afternoon and, and talking with them and seeing these videos, um, I went back to the legislature that January and I said to my leader, um, and we were in the majority by that time, we had won the majority. I said, I want the Buckle Up Baby Bill assigned to me. And he did. And I got to, I pushed it through the committee and we passed it. And when it was on final passage, I, I, I had more hate mail, Seriously. more hate mail on that issue than anything I ever did including motorcycle helmets because we, and women called me I had a phone call when it was on final passage we were final discussion of the bill and um, this woman said I have three-year-old twin daughters and I can't possibly buckle them both in by the time I get the second one in the first one would be out I was so annoyed. First of all, I wanted to be back on the floor and listening to this debate. I just lost it. And I said, lady, and I never called anybody <laughs> lady. I said, if you have three-year-old twin daughters that you cannot control, you're going to be in real trouble by the time they're 13. <laughs> And she slammed up her phone, <laughs> and I went back in and made my final remarks, and the bill passed. That's a great story. So, so the Buckle Up Baby Bill was very satisfying. The thing that took me the longest was the railroad issue. And I don't know anything about that. No, well, that's a whole other program. <laughs> but in, um, in my first term, I, I had the chance to testify at a, at a hearing because the old Rock Island Line, which is the one that comes right through here, it's now the Iowa Interstate Railroad, mm -hmm. right. it was in bankruptcy and they were going to sell it in pieces. It was going to revert to the, and what they couldn't sell, they were going to, it was going to revert to the uh, owners on both sides of the, of the adjacent landowners. And um, I just, and in my first term, the Democrats were in the minority. So I had to work with, I had to find Republicans to work with, which my leadership didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we put together a coalition and we got, uh, we established something called the Iowa Rail Finance Authority and gave them the, uh, power to issue bonds. Um, that turned out not to work because the bonds didn't have a guaranteed revenue source. So the next session we had to come back and find a revenue source. That passed the last night of the session. And um, before the ink was dry on the governor's signature, we they took us to court. The other railroads took us to court because they said this was unconstitutional. For what reason? We had a diesel fuel tax on railroads. We thought that was, the DOT thought it was constitutional because trucks pay a diesel fuel tax. Uh -huh. So um, the Supreme Court voted five to four against us. And the fifth one, the, one, the fifth no vote said, um, well, I didn't think it was unconstitutional, but I just didn't like it, so I voted against it. <laughs> now, is that the Iowa Supreme Court? Yeah, the, okay. Iowa Supreme Court. So that was uh, four years. Then the last two years, we found, oh, we didn't find another source, but we, we, by that time we had organized. This is my League of Women Voters background. I realized that you had to have some outside pressure. The legislature was not going to do this uh -huh. without some outside, you know, pressure. So, <clears throat> so I talked to a woman named Mert Levine, who was the um, city manager in Newton. Okay. And she put together 
I'd been talking with various shippers along the line and I gave her a list. She put together a meeting called train. This rail across Iowa okay. is necessary. Okay. <laughs> she had Maytag and uh, the steel company and Wilton and Pella and I, the, the big shippers mm -hmm. that really needed the railroad. Um, and um, they formed um, they formed a uh, Heartland Shippers Incorporated and began to raise money. And then they came to the legislature and said, if you could get a loan, get us a loan, mm -hmm. uh, we could put it with what we have and a loan that we can get and we could get enough to buy the railroad. So that became the Iowa Interstate. It did. Yeah. So, oh, and yeah, it is great. now the longest regional rail line in the country. It's a they long ago paid back the loan that we gave them from the legislature. Um, it's profitable. It's um, and we would not even be discussing Amtrak through here if we didn't hadn't been able to preserve that rail line. So we should get you uh, getting us Amtrak through here. I know. Get you working on that. Oh, I would. I wish. That would be great. Is, is there anything else? <laughs> oh, well, the Iowa Peace Institute was a, another thing that I found very important. When I was um, state government chair in the House, Governor Branstad decided to reorganize state government. And as a league member, um, reorganization of government is just, you know, you're like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> Just, this right. is what we live to do, right? Um, so I uh, I managed that, and as a part of that bill, um, we put in the um, what do you call it requirement. We put in the requirement that. Uh, all all state boards and commissions had to be gender balanced. Okay, and that's where that came from. Mm hmm And we were the first state, and I think still the only state. I may be wrong about that. There may be a couple of other states that have added that. And that has trickled down to the counties now, I yes. believe, and cities. A, and a, f a few years ago, the um, legislature extended that to cities and counties. And by the way, that's the pool that we're looking to now to feed the pipeline to elect more women. Mm hmm And a good one. Yes. Hopefully. Right. That's great. Yeah. Is there anything so, else that you... Well, um... You must have been very busy. I was very busy, yes. I was very busy. It was, um, let's see, what could I, how could I sum it up? Um, you know, I just think that uh, public service, whether you're elected, appointed, or what, um, is, a, is a noble thing to do. And um, we should be proud to do it. We should not shun it because we think, oh, there are people there that I don't think I'll like. Um, it's, um, and, and I think it, we have a responsibility as women, as citizens, to step up and, and, and do some public service. And, I, and it's very rewarding. How did you raise money for that? Uh, oh. That must have been a... That was, yeah. Well, first of all, it didn't take that much money in those days. Uh, but, you know, Grassley started off with three million in his, in his account mm -hmm. to start with, and I had zero. <laughs> so... We had to raise some money. My dear husband put in some money. Um, 
you know, I just had to get on the phone and call people, and we had fundraisers here and there. Um, one fun thing was that the um, Democratic Women in Hollywood had a fundraiser for us. Mm. For, well, see, 1992 was the year of the woman. Okay. Following the Anita Hill, um, Clarence Thomas, mm -hmm. uh, Clarence Thomas's confirmation hearing, and then the Anita Hill's um, accusations. And it was an all-male judiciary committee in the U.S. Senate, and that inspired a lot of women to run for Senate. So we had a record number of women running for the U.S. Congress that year, and it was dubbed the Year of the Woman, um, and a record number was elected, and that was the high point of women in the U.S. Congress until just oh, recently. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the Hollywood women, uh, it was pretty exciting to be flown out there. Oh, and okay, so they actually <laughs> flew you out there. That's I don't think great. they flew us out there. I think we had to pay for the, the flight, but they, you know, had, um, they put us up at the Wilshire Hotel and um, then they had a big fundraiser, and we got some money out of it. I don't know how much. But I met Goldie Hawn and Diane Warwick and um, some other people that I didn't really know because I'm not that much into movies. <laughs> so there are some good perks for running the there public office. There are some good perks. Yeah. yeah, we had a great time. So since we've started this conversation, there's one thing I would love to hear your thoughts about. But what do you think is what do you think campaign financing changes have done to uh, running for office com as when you were doing it compared to now? Oh yeah. Oh, what's happened is just uh, I think been very difficult, made it much more difficult for most women to run for office. Um, the, the vast amounts of money that your big political uh, rich people can put in uh, and groups and not reveal mm -hmm. who it's coming from. Uh, I think it's just uh, made it um, made it almost impossible for a lot of women to even think about running. Um, I think it's very bad for our democracy uh, to have that happen. Well, I think that it is wonderful for uh, young women and even middle-aged women, whatever, who are thinking about this, to have some good examples. And you've certainly mm -hmm. been a great example for mm -hmm. uh, the women in Iowa and, and other places as well to just get in there and do it. It sounds like it's, uh, just that's been your mantra, to just <laughs> move in and, and get going and get things done. So I think... Uh, one thing, we'll put up a contact name and number for the 5050 by 2020 group. So if there are any women who are listening to this uh, who might be interested in running for public office, uh, you can uh, write these numbers down, a website and a mm -hmm. telephone number or an address so that you can get hold of the group. And great. Jean, thank you so much for uh, doing this. This is really great. great. And I think uh, hopefully we've inspired a whole bunch of young women to <laughs> Let's hope so. run for office. Good. <laughs>